uh, Dr. Sands to bring you into the conversation. I was wondering if you could start by just talking a little bit about the terminology. What What is the relationship between epilepsy and seizures? Uh, thanks so much uh, for this really um, wonderful opportunity to, to talk to all of you. Um, so yeah, so I'm a, I'm a pediatric epileptologist. So um, additional training after child neurology to get comfortable reading the squiggly lines. And also epilepsy is just incredibly heterogeneous and there is a lot of terminology and it's, it's kind of, it's an esoteric field within an esoteric field is the way I think about it because child neurology often deals with a lot of unusual things that, um, that uh, are, are unfamiliar to uh, pediatricians and, and even to adult neurologists. And then epilepsy is, is even more kind of um, diverse and, and strange little world uh, that, that we inhabit. And, um, and so the, the, the understanding is, is, is challenging. Um, because there's a lot of uh, misunderstandings, misconceptions. So it's really a great opportunity to, to talk through these things uh, with you. And that's a great way to start is, you know, I, I love Luke's quote because it's spot on. Uh, actually, it's, it's like actually how I think about things. And one of the things that um, makes things confusing is that the terminology keeps changing. Uh, the International League Against Epilepsy actually actively changes the terminology to things. But part of the reason is that they're trying to clarify concepts. And one of the things that they did some years back was to define epilepsy in a very holistic way that encapsulates exactly what, what Luke said there um, in, in that pithy little phrase that, that they, they wrote it in a few sentences worth, but it says the same thing, that it's it's about all of the things that go with the epilepsy, not just the seizures. So, so epilepsy at its very most basic is a predisposition to having spontaneous seizures. So this is the important concept that um, anybody with a brain can have seizures, at least of a certain type, um, because that's kind of how the brain is set up to work, you know, um, most of the time for, for most people, unless they're under some, um, serious situation, like they're in a coma with traumatic brain injury, or they just had a stroke or they've got meningitis for the most part, there are mechanisms in place that prevent seizures from occurring in all of us. And then for some individuals, those controls are weakened so that they may have spontaneous seizures. And what's hard to understand and difficult to, to appreciate is that, you know, there's always a time before which the seizures start. So a time where there weren't seizures. Um, and then there's, uh, for some people, a time where the seizures no longer happen. And so epilepsy and, and over that period of time, the, the risk actually may change. And for, for individuals, um, it, it might be that different seizure types evolve over the course of their epilepsy. Things can get, get better, they may get worse um, because in the end, it's all coming from the brain and the brain keeps changing you know, in children, especially, it keeps developing and changing and making new connections and breaking old connections. Um, and so it's a dynamic thing. And I think that makes it hard too. Um, and, you know, and 99.9% .9 of the time people with epilepsy are not having a seizure, right? Even if they're very frequent, 99.9% .9 of the time, they're not actively having a seizure. So, um, uh, so figuring out what those seizures look like can be tricky a lot of times. Um, uh, and it matters because the type of seizure that an individual is having uh, to some extent dictates the, the treatment um, and also there are implications uh, that go along with it in terms of 
um, certain conditions are associated with uh, developmental regression and impairments. So kind of like what, what Luke was alluding to, um, you know, the brain's fundamental um, means of communication across long distances is electrical. And there's a normal sort of pattern of electrical activity that's supposed to happen when you're awake, when you're asleep. And I, the way I think of their waves in the end, their frequencies and amplitudes. And uh, I kind of think about it like a pond, you know, and like an, a normal pond might be uh, characterized by, you know, the, the dripping of the water off the trees that make the little ripples and the, you know, the frog, every now and then the frog jumps in the water and makes a, a little splash. And so you get these different frequencies going. But if there's some big, um, if there's some monster underneath the surface of the water thrashing around in a corner of the pond, then all of that normal activity gets overwhelmed by abnormal activity. And I think that that can contribute to um, impairments in what the brain is supposed to do. Uh, when you're awake and when you're asleep. And, and the general term for that is uh, encephalopathy, meaning that, that you're, you know, there's a problem with the functioning of the brain. And I think that that's a really important element is that distinction that the, the seizures really are an event and it's an event that can occur or manifest in, in many different ways. And I want to circle back to that uh, in the theme of you know what does what does vigilance for seizures look like for parents? But before we get to that, I was I was kind of curious just to talk a little bit more about um, the encephalopathy because seizures and epilepsy are defined by these two things. There's there's this behavioral tick or event or something that you notice, and then you go to an epileptologist, and they're going to look at it from the electrical side of things. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the convergence of those and how that helps you figure out the subtype and how that changes your treatment and management. Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, the way that we think about seizures is actually taking both of those parts and putting them together. So the term that we use is electroclinical, and it means, you know, what what does the EEG do? What does the, what does the patient do? And, and you're right, and this, this touches on, you know, surveillance for seizures or what, what does a seizure look like or what might be a seizure? Because seizures are, you know, they tend to be stereotyped, so they tend to look pretty much the same every time they happen, and they happen again and again. And so anything that is stereotyped and recurrent is the kind of thing that falls in, you know, anything that falls into that category is something that could be considered uh, a possible seizure. And so that's what I tell parents to look for in their kids. And sometimes it's, you know, sometimes it's obviously not seizures, like, you know, no, no head shaking as a stereotypy, for instance, sort of sort of like a, a behavioral thing. Um, but then there are other, other instances where you really, you can't know if it's even a seizure without the EEG. Um, uh, providing a, a correlate. And sometimes it can be quite convincing looking at a child and say, oh, that has to be a seizure. And then you look at the EEG and, and you're wrong, you know, and um, it could be that they're encephalopathic and that they're staring off and falling over just because they're completely encephalopathic and not because they're having a, a seizure derailing their brain activity at that particular moment. Um, but yeah, so there's there are two general types of seizures, broadly speaking. There are generalized seizures, which mean they start kind of everywhere in the brain all at once uh, and affect the entire brain for the for the duration of the seizure. And then there are focal seizures that start in one particular area and then they and then it spreads variably. Uh, through the brain uh, to some extent. And it can it can ultimately spread to involve the entire brain, uh, but it starts in one particular spot. And so these are like like you said earlier, these are um, events. so they they um, 
there a change uh, from, from what was happening before. And the analogy that I always liked was uh, because they're rhythmic, the rhythmic activity that starts and then has like a, a beginning, a middle and an end to it. And so the, the analogy that I like is kind of like um, people singing in a bar, like singing the national anthem. So a generalized seizure might be like uh, if, if, uh, if the game is on and everybody's standing up and, and singing because the, the national anthem is, is on television and they all, they all know to do it because that's, it's the time to do it. Um, whereas a focal seizure is, you know, maybe some uh, instigator at the bar is trying to make a, you know, trying to make a, a song, trying to sing it. And finally enough people around him sort of join in and then every, and then, and then people might join in from all over the bar. And actually, if you walk in on these two different uh, types of events, you might not know how it started, actually. And so that's why epileptologists are often obsessed with the, what's the first thing that happened during the seizure, because we're trying to figure out um, which one of those possibilities it might be. And, um, and, and then so just like, just like a song, you know, a seizure has a, a beginning, a middle and an end to it as well. So I like the analogy. I think, I think it, it kind of works. Um, yeah, and in that context, um, what kind of information or what format of information is the most constructive for families to bring to an epileptologist so that they can suss some of that out about what was the first event or what was the context um, to help get to the subtype a little bit quicker? Yeah, so... Um... Nowadays, we're increasingly spoiled because people come with videos and I love it. You know, it's really like neurologists are often sort of priding themselves on their examination, right? But epileptologists are often have been limited to history taking and sort of like interrogating parents or like, what did they do first? And, you know, it's, it's terrifying when your kid's having a seizure and it's hard to, you know, it's hard to remember what what was their right leg doing? You know, I don't know. I was trying to help them because they were having a seizure, you know? And so the, you know, when people have the wherewithal or they, or they happen to capture uh, seizures on, on video, it really, um, it's really incredibly helpful um, because all of those things that in the moment are hard to remember, like, was it, did, did they turn their head to the left? No, that's my left, or I, I you know, I don't remember. Um, those are helpful, you know, details that we can get through the video. But yeah, th those are the kinds of things that we are most interested in because they tell us what kind of seizure it is, uh, whether it's one of these generalized types of seizures, or if it's a focal seizure, where the seizure is starting in the brain and how it's, or at least how it's spreading, because as it moves through different parts of the brain, it activates different behaviors. And so we're often interested in, you know, what happened first, second, third, um, the sequence uh, of things that happen. And so to that point, and, and to your earlier point, the seizure types may change or shift over the course of a lifetime. Does it behoove patient families to be familiar with the different seizure subtypes before experiencing or witnessing them? Or, or where, where does the um, balance of kind of over-preparing versus you know, being ready to document in case something new happens? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, that's why I think um, having, you know, being able to communicate with your neurologist is the, is the main most important thing. Um, and, and knowing that anything that is stereotyped and recurrent, right? So if it happens again and again, and it's new, and you haven't talked about it with your neurologist, talk about it with your neurologist, right? That, so that's like the most basic kind of advice. There are cir circumstances where I like, you know, inject additional vigilance uh, in, into people, and that's usually in babies, because babies, it's, it, it can be quite difficult 
to sort out babies. First of all, babies do a lot of weird things to begin with. And, uh, and most of it's not seizures, but then there, when they do have seizures, sometimes the seizures can be quite subtle and hard to appreciate. And so um, in particular, I'm thinking about uh, epileptic spasms, which I know some, some families in the, in the CAN community have definitely gone through that um, infantile spasms, uh, epilepsy syndrome. And that's, you know, that's one where um, the, the movements that the child undergoes, uh, you know, the seizure, the behavioral changes can be really subtle and are often, unfortunately, um, written off or not, you know, there's a delay to diagnosis and it, and it makes a difference how soon it's, it's detected because uh, treatment, you know, the response to treatment seems to depend on how quickly the treatment is, is implemented. So, uh, so, so there, when I know that a patient has uh, a genetic epilepsy that might put them at risk or has a genetic disorder or diagnosis that might put them at risk for developing that, um, or if they have some other condition that I know predisposes them to that, then I, I go through the motions of showing them videotapes of other kids having them and, and imitate them in the clinic. And, you know, I get them all worked up about it. And it works, though, because I've had patients come in the first day that the spasms start and say, is, this is the thing that Dr. Sand showed me in the clinic and he's doing it. And so I think, I think in that case, it's helpful, but, you know, seizures can look like so many different things that I think the stereotyped and recurrent piece is the most important thing. That makes a lot of sense. And, you know, this monitoring doesn't just uh, happen at the diagnostic period, it also happens, you're, you're going to see shifts during the period that patients are responding to treatments. And, in the past, we've held you know surveys of types of epilepsy treatments that patients in our community are taking, and it's it's a pretty wide variety. And anti-epileptic drugs uh, include some some heavy hitters. And so, as people are navigating epilepsy and trying to kind of go through the trial and error of trying different epilepsy drugs, what kinds of things should they be taking into consideration uh, for a holistic approach, both from the perspective of benefits as well as side effects and risks. Yeah, well, I mean, one thing that um, that sometimes doctors forget is, uh, you know, is that is that you you know, the, it's more important to treat patients than it is to treat seizures, right? So um, I think the, the 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 medicines we use are not cures for epilepsy, and in fact, to get to terminology again the the field has changed its way of referring to these medications from anti-epileptic drugs to anti-seizure medicines. And the reason that they did that was because it doesn't change the epilepsy. You know, it suppresses seizures. That's what these drugs do. When, when they're at adequate levels, and if it is the medicine that is going to work for the kid, and I'll come back to that in a second, you know, um, then it keeps the seizures at bay when that risk is there. And then, but it's not like, you know, it's not like it's disease modifying. It doesn't, when you take the medicine away or you miss a dose, the seizures come back. And so, um, it's, in, I think it's important to treat seizures because again, I think it's more than just the event itself. I think that it does sort of, um, that that monster in the pond does kind of roil the waters and, and make it so that the brain is not doing the things that it's supposed to do, especially in the developing child. Um, uh, and seizures impact quality of life in a number of different ways, but the medications also can impact quality of life and they, and they come with side effects. And a lot of them, um, a lot of those side effects may not be so uh, substantial by themselves, but once you start piling medications on top of one another, even little things become amplified, I think. And so I think that's a challenge. That's, that's kind of what I consider to be the art of what I do is really to try to, 
strike the right balance between the um, the downsides of uh, the medications and the downsides of the seizures and try to find the right the right balance. And then because epilepsy is dynamic and um, uh, then I'm always sort of making changes. So I'm, I'm never, I'm, I'm a restless, you know, <laughs> epilepsy, epilepsy doctor, where if a kid is, is still seizing, I'm thinking, well, maybe there's a way that we can use some other medication and, and change things so that we can get better control. So I'm always, I'm never satisfied with that. And then on the flip side, if a kid stops seizing and they're on a bunch of medications, I'm thinking, well, do we really need to be on all this medication? So the, it, it's always kind of like, I'm never really satisfied. And it's a, it's a continual process as the epilepsy changes and as seizure control changes. Um, but to, but to take a, take a step back at one, one thing that everybody should think about whenever they start a new epilepsy medicine that doctors don't always remember to, to mention is the potential for allergic reactions. So, um, epilepsy medicines in particular tend to have the chemistry, the, you know, the chemicals that they are, they tend to have certain shapes that for whatever reason, trigger, uh, immune responses in some patients. And so um, across, there are some that are more notorious than others, but I would say across the board, whenever you're introducing a new medication, any sort of rashes um, or unexplained fevers or malaise, like kids acting sick, but they're not sick, they need to be evaluated. And you need to remember that the, the medication that you just started or are increasing could be um, one potential culprit. Um, and then, you know, another thing to, to say, I think that is important is yeah, the medications, you know, they work on the brain, right? Because that's, that's what seizures are. It's a form of brain dysfunction. And so there's a lot of hesitancy, I think, from families, understandably, to, you know, to, to put children on medication for seizures, because the, the medications themselves, you know, there's the perception that they're going to change the brain's function and they do. But I think what's important to understand is that the medicines wouldn't be very useful if they impacted normal brain functioning. And so what they really do is um, the reason that they're useful is because they have an outsized impact on abnormal brain function. And, um, and so it's, it's the case that for the most part, when the brain is doing its normal thing, the medicine's not so active, really. But when the brain starts to have seizure activity, that's when the, the medications are impacting that abnormal electrical activity. Um, and so I think I, I say that because I think conceptualizing it that way, it makes more sense why this would be something that doctors would want to use, you know, um, and it, it kind of addresses the underlying kind of um, reasonable concerns that people, I think, come to the table with and say, well, listen, you know, we're, my, they're just a baby, you know, and, and this is something that acts on their brain. And there's a lot of, you know, understandable reluctance related to that. So, um, so the medicines aren't all bad, but they, but it's also the case that it's a very individualized thing, right? So, uh, er, any patient can have any side effect to any medication that they, that they can, right? Because we're all individual and some of that stuff can't be predicted. I think what I advise patients about is what we typically see, like what most patients come back to me and say, oh yeah, like you said, they, this is what happened. You know, I always make sure to mention those things, but any anything that's new and different, any changes that you notice when you start a new medication are worth discussing with a neurologist. And then, you know, it's either the, the kind of thing that's going to get better over time, um, like sedation. A lot of times when you start new medicines or increase the dose, um, sedation is a big factor, but then it often improves over time. Or, you know, it's going to be the kind of thing that's going to be a lasting problem. Like, you know, some some kids get behavioral dysregulation in response to levetiracetam or Keppra. 
And, you know, that's the kind of thing that like, if it doesn't get better in a couple of weeks, then I'm throwing that medicine out the window because it's like not worth the, the additional, um, you know, behavioral issues that are, you know, because the, because the seizures, you know, the seizures are what they are, right? They're not there for 99.9% of the time, but the medicine is, right? So remember that part too, right? So. And I really appreciate what you highlight again and again, that it's context, context, context. And I think um, within the esoteric field, in the esoteric field, we have this this third filter, which is the fact that we are this heterogeneous, uh, rare disorder in which some of our patients experience epilepsy. And so I was curious, you know, you, you also work uh, not only as a clinician, but you're also a, a researcher in this field. And I was curious as you been introduced to uh, CAND, if there were any kind of considerations that run through your head as you were thinking about uh, CAND with your, your epileptologist hat on? Well, yeah, so um, I've been amazingly um, fortunate to be able to review a lot of the EEG studies directly. So so this is the, the thing is that a lot of times, um, so for CAND, right, uh, something like a third to a half of kids have epilepsy, it seems like, just looking at the literature. But the way that things are reported, because people don't really necessarily know exactly what the seizure types are, the doctors may not be using the right terminology, um, uh, it's, it, you know, it's not clear what, what seizures are actually recorded and what, what ones weren't. Um, it, it's really hard to glean from reports like that exactly what's happening out in the community, right? And so it wasn't clear to me reading things whether or not, you know, for some conditions, there's very kind of unifying, thing, like everybody gets the same kind of epilepsy syndrome, you know, um, SCN1A causes Dravet syndrome. And it's like, there's a spectrum, but it's pretty much, you know, you know what to expect based on the, um, uh, based on the gene. I, I think CAND is more complicated. Um, I've reviewed now, um, thank you for sending all the EEGs my way. I reviewed um, over 400 hours of, uh, from something like 17 different patients um, and across a lot of different ages. Uh, mostly the younger than five crowd which is a, a great age to look at because the brain is very dynamic and it changes a lot on the EEG during that time. Um, I can talk about EEG too uh, in a minute. Maybe it's good to, to sort of go to the slides and look at some things and talk about what I'm looking at. Uh, but just to say that, um, you know, I think that there are a lot of interesting things coming out that I didn't expect based on the reports. Like for instance, I think that the big cohort study from 2021, Dr. Dr. Chung's uh, manuscript, there there was, uh, you know, I think absence seizures came up as being a big, a big seizure type, um, and that's the kind of thing that um, I, I haven't seen very much um, of that in the EEGs that I've read so far. And, you know, it could also be selection bias, you know, what I happen to get from people, but, um, but I, I see a lot of other kinds of things, actually. Um, so it's interesting. Uh, let me, let me talk about EEG, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. I think it's, I think it's helpful. I'm not going to go into the physics of it. Um, boring, right? Um, but um, I did want to say sort of like for, for people, when you're in the room and your kid's on EEG, a lot of what you see on the screen, if, you, if, you, if they let you look at the screen, which is always like, a, you know, because it raises a lot of anxiety. I think it's, it's good not to look at the screen. But if you look at the screen, you're going to see a lot of uh, squiggly lines. And the, and the most sort of pronounced stuff that you see, like these big up and down jagged stuff on these these studies. These are normal studies actually. So these studies actually have a lot of artifact on them. And artifact just refers to um, non-cerebral 
causes of the squiggly lines getting deflected. Um, but if you look at the lines, basically what we've got is you can see a bunch of letters and numbers, and that's the positioning of the electrodes on the head, which um, kind of looks like this. And these are the um, these are all the places you could put them, but we the ones with the labels are where we actually put them. Um, you know, on a standard EEG. And so what these electrodes are doing is they're recording the electrical potentials at different sites on the scalp. And so just the voltage coming from the brain at different parts of the scalp, different points. And those kind of reflect um, parts of the brain. So you can see here on the diagram of the brain, the brain has a bunch of different lobes. And the EEG is somewhat limited because um, it's really, you know, out on the surface of the scalp. So out on this sort of spherical kind of uh, surface, but the brain itself is convoluted and uh, full of wrinkles and deep spots. And, you know, it has a kind of like a shelf in the front under the frontal lobe and in the back, there's a big part where the two hemispheres come together. Um, and then there's actually that purple, the, this brain is actually cut away. The green, part of the green is cut away so that you could see the purple. The purple is like a hidden lobe of the brain called the insula. And of, so of course that's all deep to um, the electrical fields that we're recording. And so what we, it really is, I like the surface of the pond analogy again, because we're really not seeing all of the stuff underneath the surface. We just sort of see what kind of bubbles up um, and so that's an important point. Um, and so what these squiggly lines are at the end of the day is just at those different points on the scalp, the voltage changes. So uh, in terms of its amplitude, and then on the x-axis is time. So it's just how the amplitude of the voltage on the different parts of the, of the head is changing over time. That's it. And, you know, as the amplitude sort of... Um, goes up and down, uh, it makes waves and the waves can be characterized in different frequency spectra. Oh, this is just an example that sometimes, <laughs> sometimes you'll see this on the recording and it's like, there's a lot of noise and you're thinking that the epileptologist can't possibly get any useful information out of this. But just to show you that we have tricks, this is the same EEG after I play with it um, so that you, you know, you can be reassured that if you know, that they're not pulling your leg when they tell you that they can still make heads or tails out of what they're recording. These are the different frequencies. So we can kind of, we, uh, you know, it's how many waves per second. So we group them um, into different categories, depending on how fast or how slow they are. Um, and a normal EEG actually undergoes, over the course of development, undergoes some changes in terms of its organization. And in particular, the rhythm that's highest amplitude in the back of the head called the posterior dominant rhythm actually changes over time and um, speeds up uh, from when you're just a few months old uh, up until you're three. So from three months to three years, it, it undergoes quite a, quite a bit of change and then it kind of plateaus out uh, and, you're, and you're pretty much like at an adult speed at that point. And so, um, so the way that, and this is interesting. So the way that I teach the, the residents about abnormalities on the EEG is exactly the way that they recently, there was a recent high profile article uh, where they trained, uh, you know, they developed like an AI to categorize EEGs and, they, and it came up with the same categorizations. Because I think it's so basic and so easy to, uh, to divide up. So basically, abnormalities are either epileptiform, meaning that they're related to that risk for seizures that we were talking about, or they're not epileptiform, meaning, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a sign that there's something wrong, that there's some dysfunction, but it doesn't necessarily mean seizures. Like there are other ways in which the brain could be um, misbehaving that, that don't have to do with seizures. And those abnormalities can either be in one particular location or a few particular locations, 
or they can kind of be diffuse and spread out all over the whole brain. And that's really it. That grid, that four by four grid basically captures what there is. And so for epileptiform, so for, for seizure types, right? If, you know, you tend to see focal spikes, focal discharges for people who have focal seizures. So in the bar analogy, the guy trying to get everybody singing is kind of popping off every now and then trying to get it going. But, you know, but 99.9% .9 of the time, nobody goes along with it. And then uh, for the generalized seizure types, uh, there's a big burst that affects the entire, you know, the, all of the squiggly lines go off at the same time. And, um, and that's kind of like an aborted flash mob kind of situation. So people stand up to sing the national anthem and nobody's on cue and everybody's off key and they sit back down. And so those are the things that we see in between seizures in people with epilepsy. And it's a lot of what we have to rely on because capturing seizures can be difficult, like we talked about. So this is like EEG is the most important tool that we have in epilepsy because it tells us what the electrical activity of the brain is doing. Um, these are focal discharges. So just showing you some, uh, some examples of where there are spikes in particular locations. Um, and then this is generalized. So it's sort of everywhere all at once. Um, and this is just an example of how you can have a non-epileptiform abnormality in the form of slowing related to something that's happening with the brain in this picture. And then I was going to show you seizures. I think I have some in here. Just as an example. Here we go. Yeah, so... So the, the first panel shows a focal onset seizure. So there's, um, there's, let me get a pointer going here. Uh, where is that stuff? How do you do that again? Great question. Uh, what is that? No, that's not it. Oh, down here. Gotta be down here. Here we go. Is that it? No. Yep. Yep. Okay. So um do you see here and, and here? So this is the this is the front on the left side, and that's where this you can see that there's something happening here. That I'll tell you that most of this is eye movements and uh blinking and not anything epileptic, but there's something rhythmic that starts here and it's going here and you can see that it grows in amplitude and spreads. And so it's really affecting most, uh, mostly the left temporal area. Um, whereas this other uh, EEG is showing you a generalized seizure where you know, you'd be hard pressed to say where this burst is starting. It kind of looks like it's everywhere all at the same time. So that that in a nutshell is is EEG. That's that's what I've been looking at, and um, and right. So I would say that a lot of what I've seen in the canned EEGs, uh, especially in the in the kids who are um, five years and under, are the focal spikes, and a lot of times they're they're multifocal. So they have more than one area, and it tends to be you know, from what I've seen, it tends to be not the front half of the brain so much as the back half of the brain that uh, is where these are, have been mostly located. So the, the, all the, you know, the frontal lobes are so big that they are fully half of the brain. So we're talking about all the other lobes, uh, parietal lobes, the temporal lobes, the occipital lobes. Um, so that's, that's what I was seeing a lot of. Um, and you would think that that means focal seizures. And I think that, you know, it, it may, but you can also, if there are enough, you know, if it's multifocal and there are enough focal spikes, you can also have generalized uh, seizure types. So that gets confusing. So at some point, multifocal becomes, diff you know, the same thing as diffuse. And so um, I, there's definitely at least one patient with, for instance, atonic seizures, I think where the, the head will drop, you know, suddenly, 
and the but the EEG is showing me focal spikes, not generalized discharges. And I think that's that makes sense. Um, it seems like you know we have some longitudinal data on the EEG, which is really interesting. So that means you know patients who had more than one EEG, and that's that's particularly valuable. That's particularly valuable because um, it tells us how things might change over time for some patients. And, and so I, there are some patients, for instance, where the initial EEGs are normal up out until like um, sometime between the first year and the third year of life and, and things and the spikes start to show up sometime between one and two or one and uh, two and three, like those ages, those toddler years, um, is where the spikes seem to show up for some patients. And then for some patients, you know, sort of like what we've been talking about where the spikes might be, you know, that the abnormal activity might be um, causing some degree of encephalopathy or, or affecting the rest of the EEG. Um, I think that there is some sign that that happens sometimes. Um, um, hold on just a second. Sorry, ch child care things. Um, so yeah, so the, um, uh, where was I? So yeah, so there's some evidence that the kids may be getting affected by um, the spikes as they evolve during those toddler years. And I'm digging a little bit more into the clinical background on those cases to try to understand the significance of that and what it's related to. Um, there are patients with generalized epilepsy too, or at least generalized discharges. Um, and, and those patients have all been kind of on the older side. And I don't know if that's because we don't have longitudinal data sort of showing that one kind of thing turns into another. I don't know if that's something that evolves over time or if they're always like that. And we, it's just the sample that we have. So a lot of the work that I'm doing is going to raise questions more than answer them, but I think it'll be important for the kinds of questions that it raises. Um, you know, there's going to be an effort to try to tie all this back to genotype. So what particular variants they have or wh where the, where those variants are located in KIF-1A. And I think those are all important sort of things. And I, I think that keeps coming back to the theme of uh, we need more numbers on this on this study uh, eventually to to smooth this out and look for some more of these trends. So I've just dropped a link to the epilepsy study that has some information about how you can uh, acquire as well as send information to Dr. Sands for this study. Um, so every every participant really helps a lot. You know, in the in the perfect world, if we understood kind of how things evolve for which patients, we might be able to address them better. Um, you know, using medications to try to prevent um, the electrical activity from causing other problems. You know, uh, like if we knew that the toddlers were going to develop some issues related to their oh, yeah, EEG. Uh, abnormalities, then we might be able to kind of try to head that off in some kind of way. Um, so yeah, so I think I think or, or know what you know what medications worked for for patients that did well, even though you know uh, even though they fit the the pattern of of other patients, maybe they get through it and they're they do better. Um, uh, knowing what medications were used for those patients could be critical. So I think there's a lot to be learned and you're right. It's just a matter of, uh, of numbers and, and, and getting the data. It's hard though, you know, you have to, to get EEG, it's not, it's not like getting medical records, right? You can call medical records, get medical records. It's not, it's not that difficult, but EEG, um, because it's, it's a different type of data that's stored differently. It's, it's more challenging to get even than 
like MRI scans, right? You have to, you have to contact the neurologist. It's the tech, it's the technologist that actually, you know, put the electrodes on that are, those, those are the folks that can download the studies uh, um, and onto some kind of media for, for, to, you know, to, to be sent around. Um, and so it's, it, it takes more effort to get that. And if, if anybody attending or who watches this video down the road is uh, interested in getting more information on those specific steps or, or needs help with some of the logistics, you can reach out to us at impact at kip1a.org and we'll uh, help you walk through some of those steps. Um, I wanted to, oh, uh, this is a perfect timing actually because I wanted to get out of the way and let uh, the families ask some questions. So uh, Madeline, uh, you had a question about the ketogenic diet. Yes, I I would like to uh, th thanks thanks first of all for for, for this talk uh, most interesting. Um, I was wondering if there are any data available on the use and on the rate of success of uh, ketogenic diet in these canned children or adults. Could you comment on that? So um, I don't know. Uh how much um, it's been it's been used uh, and I and I will look through uh, the data I have not looked at that uh, part yet um, but I would say that ketogenic diet is one of the most powerful treatments for seizures that we have in general uh, however it's it's challenging right so it's attractive because it sounds like it sounds like a non, you know, and it is a non-medication way to manage seizures. Um, and a lot of people hear ketogenic diet and they think about the, like the fad keto diet that's kind of like going around, you know, lately. Um, and, but it's, it's actually quite different. Um, and it's a bit of a challenge um, on a, in a number of regards to implement in patients. Um, one challenge is that uh, th the diet is quite strict. And so it really requires carefully meeting out how much carbohydrate, but also not just carbohydrate, but actually protein, because protein is, is made up in part of carbohydrate. And so in in, in growing children, they need protein. They can't, um, you know, ketogenic diet is a high fat diet, but they can't, they can't do without protein. They need it to grow. And so the, you know, the, the dietitians that work on a ketogenic diet team have to carefully construct a, a regimen that still provides adequate nutrition for kids to continue to grow and still have their bodies utilizing the ketone bodies as the primary fuel source. And so that's, that's, a, real, that's a real challenge. Um, it's also challenging just behaviorally to implement. Um, the, the food is different, you know, and, um, and it, it doesn't take much to kick somebody out of ketosis. And, and when that happens, they may actually have rebound seizures. And so, uh, you know, it doesn't take somebody slipping the kid a cookie or the kid finds a cookie or, you know, anything like that. And, and it's, uh, it's kind of a disaster. So um, it's a wonderful treatment in terms of its, its efficacy. I think it, it works really well for a lot of different seizure types. Um, but there are kind of substantial logistical uh, issues with actually implementing it. And could, I, could you could you uh, comment on on the rate of success? So, how, what what is the percentage of patients which are being treated successfully by a ketogenic diet? Not not necessarily children, 
Yeah, so I, I don't know for, again, for CAND, I don't have numbers, but I would say that, and I don't actually have numbers for epilepsy in general, but, and the part of the reason is that we reserve it, right? So it's not like there have been head-to-head -head comparisons between, uh, you know, some anti-seizure medication and the ketogenic diet. It tends to be the kind of thing that we turn to when the medications are failing, and then we're looking for improvements, just like we may not eradicate seizures entirely from some patients using medications. A lot of times that's what we're shooting for with ketogenic diet as well. But I will tell you that, you know, my impression is that a head to head comparison between ketogenic diet and any medication off the shelf, it would probably favor the ketogenic diet that it's, it's that sort of powerful of a treatment. It's just very challenging to, to work with. Now, that said, a lot of, you know, it's, it is just like medications because it tends to be very individualized. So some patients, you know, they, they don't respond to ketogenic diet either, and they may do better on, on something else. So the, one of the frustrating things about epilepsy and one of the things that makes me a restless sort of provider like I referred to before, is that in, in, at the end of the day, it's so individualized that it really is trial and error. And so you don't know unless you, unless you do it, whether or not it's, there are going to be side effects, whether or not it's going to work. And so that process is very frustrating, you know? And so what I try to do, at least in, in my practice, is to move through things quickly enough that we know, you know, to get rid of something when it's not working. So this is a little bit of an aside, but just one thing that drives, I think families crazy and drives me crazy too, is kind of like incrementalism. So they have a seizure, okay, we'll increase the dose a little bit. The same medicine, right? And then they have another seizure and increase the dose a little bit. Another seizure, increase the dose a little bit. Well, you could do that forever. And when are you when are you going to get it through your head that that medicine isn't working, right? So for me, I tend to be more aggressive, and I say we'll make a big jump with the medicine, and then we call it like if it you know if the seizures continue and we didn't didn't touch it to make a big jump, then we're done, then we're moving on, we're doing something different, you know. There has to be a stopping point, and that way you sort of cycle through the possibilities faster. Maybe you come quicker to the conclusion that ketogenic diet might be something to consider uh, in a patient and, and move along that pathway sooner. Um, because I think, I think a lot of time gets lost sort of um, with incremental changes that aren't really getting anywhere. That's like a manual thing. There are other ways to do things too. I don't want to disparage other, you know, other ways of practicing, but that's, that's something that I've, I, you know, that, I, that bothers me. Okay. Thanks so much. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. I have more concrete answers for you on that, but I do think that it's, it, if medications are not working, it's something that worth, you know, it's worth considering. And just to know that there are, apart from the logistical challenges I mentioned, there are side effects of ketogenic diet as well. Um, you know, so it's it's not like a, it's not a normal diet and there are issues that have to be uh, managed. Okay. I did have one more question, which is a little bit more uh, oriented towards uh, our research network, I suppose, which is uh, when we think about subtypes of epilepsy and trying to you know, pursue potential new drugs that might manage seizurogenic phenotypes, um, when we test those in pre-clinical systems, um, is there anything that you observe when you're looking at uh, epilepsy studies when you're considering whether or not the model might apply well to the disorder itself? Yeah, that's a, that's a hard one. Um, I don't, you know, I don't know um, how readily those things translate over. So I. I have a laboratory and I do, I do bench research as well. And, um, and as somebody who works with models, I, I would say that, you know, like 
the, the models have limitations, right? And so, uh, you know, individuals, I think for disease modifying therapies, it's a different story, right? So it kind of doesn't matter if the model does X, Y, or Z, it doesn't matter how close it is to what humans are doing. If, if the disease modifying treatment reverses the thing that it's doing to the neurons in a dish or reverses the thing in the mouse, then that's good because it's proof of principle that you can undo the problem, right? But when it comes to like, you know, which anti-seizure medication might be best, you know, for, I, I think that's, that's going to be too removed because um, even, even mice and things don't develop the same seizure types that you would expect for, for the condition that they're modeling. And so much depends on the specific networks involved and they just don't have those, you know, and even things like brain organoids aren't going to, there's, you're not going to be able to replicate like tonic seizures in brain organoids, I don't think. Um, so, so I think, you know, it's, it's still going to be come down to clinical data. And that's why the EEGs are really important and the clinical information is really important and, and it's trial and error. And that's why, you know, like from a, from a practice uh, perspective, like moving through and when figuring out what's not going to work sooner rather than later for people who are having seizures, uh, I think is the, is the right approach. So. Yeah, I was on the prize. I, I have a I have a question, uh, Dylan and Dr. Sands, I, and this is for a, a lot of um, of the newer diagnosed families. One of the things that we often hear is, um, and I think you touched on it, but just uh, again, we often hear, you know, you uh, your child has irregular irregular brain activity, or uh, you know, a suspicious EEG, but not seizures. Is that you know, and, and then the neurologist sends the, you know, the family off without medication. Uh, when we hear that from a clinician, is that something that we should uh, investigate further about treating or an intervention? It's a really good question. So the, the, I, I think what you're, what you're getting at is um, if, if there's abnormalities on the EEG, that are sort of like epileptic abnormalities, epileptiform discharges, spikes, you know, and there aren't seizures, then is that something that we should treat? Right. Is that getting at the question a little yeah, bit? Yeah, that, that is the question. And actually, I think quite literally, like we see, you know, in, in our community and just talking and in our Facebook group and everything, we'll say, well, we went to get an EEG and it, the words are the same that the the doctors use, right? An irregular EEG or irregular brain activity. So the word irregular is always in there. And to me, if it's something that's not regular, you should examine it more and possibly treat it. So my question to you is when families hear that, instead of going off on their way, hoping it'll resolve itself, should should we really, really dig in and, and, and talk to our neurologists about uh, interventions and treatments? It's, it's, a, it's a fraught sort of um, thing. So the, this is like a whole area of controversy, but um, there are two schools of thought. One school of thought is uh, you treat the seizures, not the EEG. Okay. And there's another school of thought that says, no, no, no. The, those abnormalities on the EEG are uh, maybe associated with additional impairments in development, in, in developmental domains. And there are good examples of that kind of thing where... Um, uh, for instance, something called the Landau-Kleffner syndrome, which is like the, maybe the best example of this, which is where um, the patients may not have seizures at all or may have very rare seizures, but on their EEG, they have very broad, very diffuse spikes that become amplified in sleep and become continuous during sleep. And those, those children, that syndrome was originally identified because there was a set of kids in a home for the deaf, for the hearing impaired, who actually had nothing wrong with their hearing, 
but it had developed an inability, a progressive inability to understand language. And actually some of them, even the inability to associate certain sounds with their salience, like what, what a doorbell ringing means. So, and, and so that kind of regression uh, associated with, mainly with the spikes on the EEG raised the concern that there's a entity of, you know, the, the term for the, that the, that the epileptologists use for this is epileptic encephalopathy. So brain dysfunction related to the epilepsy. In other words, not because of the KIF-1A or whatever the underlying cause is, but something added, something extra, something due to the spikes and, and seizure activity itself that's driving the developmental outcomes in a way that's added. It's, it's on top of it. And, you know, infantile spasms is another example because that's a whole syndrome that sort of, um, you could have a kid who has some pre-existing brain injury or has a genetic disorder, and then they develop the spasms and they're worse. They're worse off for, in terms of their development, they, they go backwards um, or, they, or they just stagnate and stop developing. So we know that this happens. The question is, to what extent is this true for all spikes on all EEGs, right? And, and to what degree should we be trying to suppress those spikes? And from a practical standpoint, it's it's a difficult thing because if you thought that balancing medications to treat seizures was a tough thing to do in terms of balancing side effects and, and multiple medications, suppressing spikes is far harder than suppressing seizures. So then you're really sort of, you know, asking for something that would be quite difficult to accomplish. Um, and unfortunately, the, the, I think the way that things are trending, um, there's more and more evidence that spikes are not benign, that they are bad for the brain, and that the more there are, the worse things are, and that, um, and that you know, what, what we don't know is, well, how much do we need to treat them to make a difference? And that data is not there. But there's some very interesting work being done at Stanford uh, by a friend of mine uh, named Dr. Balmer, who she's studying um, one of the most common epilepsies in childhood, which is, you know, uh, uh, the epile focal epilepsy associated with central temporal spikes, which used to be called benign Rolandic epilepsy. It's like one of the most common epilepsies in childhood. It starts usually when, when the spikes show up when kids are like three and they go away when they're like 12. And, and over that time, they may have a handful of seizures. But, you know, people have been doing very careful neuropsychological testing on those kids. And it, it seems like over the course of their illness, even though they're fine and even though they might not be even treated for their seizures because they don't really have them, the spikes that they have during their sleep in particular, this is a condition where the spikes come out in sleep and sleep's really important for consolidating memory and things like that. There's more and more evidence suggesting that these kids are actually somehow suffering some deterioration in relatively speaking, it's not anything that would, that, you know, very noticeable, but in general, they do less well than you would have predicted for them in certain domains, especially those, affect, you know, with respect to language uh, over that decade of time that they're having just a ton of spikes during their sleep. And so the, the, the community in the field of epilepsy is going to have to come to grips with this idea that the spikes themselves may be uh, bad and that, you know, that they may, may need to be targeted in a broader population than just the patient. Right now, we really target them. If people come to us and they say the child is, is regressing or they're plateauing developmentally, there's a problem and we look at the EEG and there's a ton of spikes, yet most of us will take a shot at trying to reduce the spikes and see if we can help the kid.
but this would imply, you know, if Dr. Bomber is correct in the, in the work that's being done, it really suggests that probably we should be going after spikes in, across the board in a lot of patients that are not currently sort of being treated that way. So that's a long answer to your question, but it's a very kind of controversial and kind of fraught issue right now. In the field. Uh, that's a great answer. Thank you so much. I think it really provi provided a lot of clarity, certainly to me, and I hope others too. Thanks, Dr. Sands. Yeah, you probably come across a lot of like discrepancies, like some doctors saying, ah, oh, I don't worry about that. And yeah, some doctors, yeah, yeah. there are all these spikes. We have to do something. You know, it's it's hard to know what's right. And often I think that our families uh, don't have the uh, opportunity, be it because of where they live or who they're seeing to, to have that overnight EEG and how, you know, I, I wonder how critical that is for people uh, when they hear that irregular brain activity, is that something that they should pursue with their clinician too, is can we have an overnight EEG? Yeah. And I think that goes into a, a broader conversation about how can we, how can we better prepare our families to advocate for the specific needs that can predispose us towards so that we can catch those things as early as possible and, and get on the right track as soon as possible. Yeah. I think that's why I'm most intrigued by this longitudinal data that tracks kids from early on. And, and if there's really a sign that like when the spikes show up, the EEG starts to get disorganized in a certain way, then it really sort of makes a compelling argument for, for something like that, you know? Yeah. Well, we look forward to learning more as you do. And uh, I do just want to thank you for stepping into this conversation. I think it's a really complicated disease area and there's a lot of ambiguity and nuance and things that we don't know. And so I just uh, really appreciate the way that you were able to approach this from a uh, uh, sky high view as well as getting into the, the context and the specifics of what it means for our community. So thank you so much, Dr. Sands. You're very well. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Thanks, thanks Dr. Sands. Thanks, Dylan. Everybody, thank you so much for all your work.